last year, we spent a, quite a good portion of the year looking at the book of Exodus. We, we got halfway through the first 20 chapters of the book. We completed that much, and there are 20 more chapters, so we're going to dive back into Exodus for this fall, and probably up until Christmas we'll be in Exodus. So let's jump back in where we left off, Exodus 21. We'll be looking today at verses 1 through 11. If you didn't bring a Bible, there are plenty in the back of the pews in front of you. Please take one and open to uh, the second book of the Bible, Exodus about halfway through that book, chapter 21. When you've found that place, I'll invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master and my wife and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever." When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food or clothing or her marital rights. If he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Please be seated. Louis Free was director of the FBI from 1993 until 2001. During his time as the director of the FBI, he ordered that all new classes of FBI agents visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Why would he want FBI agents to visit the Holocaust Museum? James Comey explains it this way. So they could see and feel and hear in a palpable way the consequences of the abuse of power on a massive, almost unimaginable scale. He wanted all FBI agents to beware of what the abuse of power could lead to. The abuse of power is not limited. The abuse of authority is not limited to government leaders, military leaders, employers, law enforcement, business management, teachers, even parents have been known to abuse their authority. When you ignore the welfare and dignity of those under your authority for selfish reasons, you have abused your authority. And the laws given in the scripture that we have read today are designed to keep that from happening. Let me remind you of the context. The people of God were slaves in Egypt for 400 years under the cruel oppression of Pharaoh for the most part of that. God, through signs and wonders and plagues, led them out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea. By mighty miracles, he delivered them from slavery in Egypt. Now the people have journeyed to Mount Sinai where God has given them the Ten Commandments He's made a covenant with his people. And the next section of Exodus is what we might call the book of the covenant. In this, God lays out what it looks like for his people to live in this world as his people. What does it look like to live as God's people? The the practical ways that they should live and carry 
themselves every day begin here in chapter 21. And you may think it strange that God would begin these, these rules for everyday life with slavery. Well, there's a good reason for this, I believe. You see, the Israelites were former slaves. And it would be unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable, for them to treat one another the way that Pharaoh had treated them. So God wants to make sure that they understand. Now, here's something you need to keep in mind. Why didn't God just eliminate slavery altogether? Where as we go through, you're going to understand why. There are some very good reasons why. God allowed servitude of certain types, but it was always designed with safeguards and protection for the one who was serving. And you'll see and understand more as we go through. Here's something we have to keep in mind as we begin to look at this. Hebrew slavery was nothing like, absolutely nothing like, the awful practice of slavery in America's past. Hebrew slavery did not resemble what we experience in this country in any way, shape, or form. The slavery that happened in this country was godless and wicked. And as you'll see in these verses, the rules given here are designed to prevent exactly that from happening. To avoid the kind of slavery that took place in Africa, in early America, and still take pla takes place in many places even to this day. Now, thankfully, slavery of any sort is no longer a reality in America, but this scripture is still very important, and here's why. Because it teaches us a very important principle about the exercise of authority. See, there are no slaves in our country today, but there are many people, many of you, who have some position of authority. Employer, supervisor on your job, a parent or a grandparent, a teacher. We got a ton of teachers in our church who are going to have kids back in their classrooms this week. Listen, there are a lot of you who have authority over some people in your life. And this scripture has very important principle for how you exercise that authority. How God would have you before him to exercise authority. Now, now I want to look at this scripture in three headings. First of all, what we learn about God. Let's look at this scripture and ask ourselves this question. What do we learn about God from these rules he's given us about slavery? Here's what we learn. You ready? God cares about the welfare and dignity of those under our authority. God cares about the welfare and dignity of those under authority our authority. Now we're going to walk through these rules and exp I'm going to explain them and you're going to see for yourself that God is protecting and ensuring the welfare and dignity of those who might be enslaved as Hebrews. Now several things you need to know about Hebrew slavery. First of all Hebrew slavery was voluntary. Hebrew slavery was voluntary involuntary slavery forcing another Hebrew to be your slave was illegal and against the law of God and could not be done slavery among Hebrews was always and only voluntary and here's how it worked a person who was poor or had gotten himself in deep debt and had no way to pay his debt and still sustain his own life and family would sell himself to another Hebrew who was rich. We might call it hiring out, but it's more than that. He actually would become, in a sense, property of this other Hebrew person, this rich Hebrew person. He would go and live on that Hebrew, uh, on his master's property. He would work. His shelter would be provided. His clothing would be provided. 
everything he needed would be provided and he would be given an income. Since everything he needed was provided, his income could be used to pay off his debts. Are you with me? Or his income could be used to help him get himself established where he could eventually live on his own. So Hebrew slavery was voluntary. And here's something else you need to understand. Hebrew slavery was temporary. Look at verse 2. He shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. See, the master had to buy the Hebrew slave. He had to pay money to get another Hebrew to be his slave. But after six years, the slave would go free and he did not have to buy his freedom. It was given to him without money. This is the Sabbath principle. Work for six, rest on the seventh. The Sabbath principle extended to all Hebrew slaves. They would be released after their sixth year. They would go out free. And here's the important thing for you to understand. They did not go out free empty-handed. Listen to the instructions given in Deuteronomy 15, verses 12 through 15. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. See, they didn't just let them go on their own. No, they, they gave them all that they needed to get started on their own again. Wine and money and supplies and animals, grain. See, here's the thing I need you to understand. Hebrew slavery had a constructive purpose. The poor, those in deep debt, could become members of a stable household where their needs could be met and they could work to pay off their debt. There was an advantage for both the master and the servant in this arrangement. It was for a constructive purpose. Now, there's something important to notice in verses 5 and 6. Actually, it begins in verse 3. If a man comes in single, he goes out single. If the slave was purchased as a single man when he left, he would be single. If when he went into servitude, he was married, his wife would go free with him. However, in some instances, a man would be, be bought as a slave, as a single man, but the master would give him another slave, a female slave, to marry. And they might have children. In this instance, when it came time for the man to go free, he would go out alone. And here's why. Because the other slave was the property of the master. And you say, well, that's, that's wrong, that's cruel. It shouldn't be that way. Well, there's a very good reason for this rule. You see, if this man was released and became a very productive member of society, then he would soon be able to buy his family, redeem them for himself. Well, what happens... If this man goes free, and before long, he's gone through what his master gave him, and he's right back where he started. Then what happens to the wife and children? They're left destitute. And under this arrangement, the wife and children are protected until the man proves that he is able to care for a wife and family. If you're with me, do this. This is a protection for the wife and children. If the man is able, he certainly will be allowed to redeem them, according to Leviticus 25, verses 47 through 55. But if he failed, got back in debt, his family would not have to suffer for his mistake. They would be part of a stable household where they would be cared for. But there's something else that I need to point out to you. After slavery, after his six years, a man was not required to go free. He didn't have to. Verse 5 says, 
If the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I don't want to go out free. And it's hard for you to think if a man's a slave, why in the world wouldn't he go out free? This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Slavery for Hebrews is not like we understand it. He would be well taken care of. He would have a stable household to be a part of. He would have a stable job. His family would be taken care of. And he might very well think, I can't do any better than this on my own. My master's good to me. He treats me well. He pays me well. I have everything I need and want. Why would I leave? In that case, the man doesn't have to go free. He's taken to the doorpost of the house. His ear is placed against the doorpost and an awl, which is a little tool for punching holes, usually in leather, an awl would be nailed through his ear into the doorpost of the house. And that's to symbolize something. It's to symbolize this man is now a permanent part of this household. It's like, you know, nailing him to the house. He, he is now permanently attached to this household. And then he will remain for the rest of his life a part of a permanent member of that household. But understand, that's only voluntary. The, the master can't force his slave to remain a part of the household. It's only if he chooses to because he loves his master and he wants to stay. This is what I need you to see. All of these laws were to protect the welfare and dignity of the slave while at the same time providing justice for the master. And then he moves on to talk about, in verse 7, to talk about maid servants, the Bible often calls them. This is females. The first verses talk about the male slave. Verses 7 through 11 discuss the female. Notice what verse 7 says. When a man sells his daughter as a slave... She shall not go out as the male slaves do. In other words, after six years, she's not released like the male slaves are. You say, well, that's discriminatory. That's wrong. Well, it wasn't. It was very wise, and here's why. Daughters would be sold as servants for a poor man who is trying to improve his daughter's prospects. In other words, she, he doesn't have a, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have any real prospects for her. He's poor and he's in debt. He doesn't want her to suffer because of his own poverty. So he can sell her into servitude, into the household of a rich man in hopes that she becomes a permanent member of the household. Marries the son or is given to one of the sons as a wife or is given to another member of the household as a wife and she can be well taken care of and have a good life. This is why it's, it's not like you see in many countries today like Thailand where poor villages, mothers and fathers will sell their children into sex slavery for money. This is not like that at all. It was done for the benefit of this girl to try to improve her prospects in the world. And here's why it's important for her not to be released after six years. Because a woman who does not belong to a household is vulnerable to all kinds of danger. In the ancient Near East, a woman on her own, apart from a household, is in very much danger. So well, it shouldn't be like that. Well, I agree, but it was. Women needed the protection of a household, of a, of a family, to keep them from being taken advantage of in all the ways you can imagine and then some. So by not setting them free, it actually protects them. It, it actually keeps them safe. It's not safe 4,000 years ago for a woman to be turned loose in society on her own. It's not safe. There are several safeguards provided here for the welfare and dignity of these female slaves. 
Here's one of them. You see it in verse 8. If a master decides he doesn't want her service, she comes to the household, she serves, he decides he doesn't want her, he must allow her to be redeemed normally by her own family. In other words, he can't just turn her loose. He can't sell her to foreign people who would mistreat her. He has to allow her to be redeemed by her own family or by another Hebrew family who wants her. He can't turn her loose just because he, well, I changed my mind. Can't do that. Why? Because it's, God doesn't want these people in servitude to suffer. Secondly, verse 9, if the woman, the, the, the female servant is given in marriage to the son, I love this, this verse, then the master shall treat her as a daughter. In other words, once the female servant is married to the son, she's no longer a servant in the family. Now she becomes as family. She's treated as a daughter, adopted in a sense. This is what the father who sold a daughter to another household would hope for, that she would become an actual full-fledged member of this wealthy household, like adoption. In verses 10 and 11, we see these instructions. Suppose the son decides he doesn't want this woman to be his wife after they've already married or engaged, and suppose he goes and takes another wife. Here's what the Word of God says. Look at it, verse 10. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, clothing, her marital rights. In other words, all of her basic needs must continue to be met as before when she was his wife. In other words, he can't just get rid of her. He has to provide her food. It says clothing, which actually refers to shelter and marital rights. Kids, if you don't know what that means, ask your parents when we get home. In other words, he can't just cast her away. He has to take care of her. And look at what verse 11 says. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without paying the money. In other words, she has to be allowed to go back to her home. And he does not, uh, it, no money is required, no, no payment from the family is required. He has to allow her to go back home. And again, what I'm trying to get you to see is all of these rules are designed to protect the welfare and the dignity of those who are in service to another. Now, we could debate whether or not, um, you know, whether or not God should have allowed slavery to exist at all. God did it. That means it's right. Anything God does is right because he's God. He makes the rules. We don't. But when you understand slavery this way, you understand it's nothing like the slavery that we know and abhor. God also hates that kind of slavery. This was a constructive opportunity for people who are at a lower level in society to try to elevate themselves. It, it, things were not like they are today. They couldn't get a Pell Grant and go to college to try to get a better job. You, you understand? their only opportunity for some people was to try to get attached to a wealthier household where they could receive uh, training and a job. Do you think about that? When a, when a young man is sold into servitude to a, a wealthy household, he's going to learn different work and things that he can do. Then when he's released, he'll know how to do it on his own. He's going to be provided with everything he needs. In some ways, it's like a six-year apprenticeship. He's learning, preparing him for life. So God allowed certain forms of servitude, but always with safeguards protect, to protect the welfare and dignity of those who served. We need to move on. We talked about what we learned about God through this. When you look at these rules, the way God gave these rules, you learn that God cares about the welfare and dignity of those who are under the authority of another. He absolutely cares. That's why he gave these rules. What do we learn about ourselves? We look at these rules for how others under authority should be treated, what do we learn about ourselves? Well, to answer that question, we can ask another question. Why are these laws necessary? Why did God even have to give these laws? 
Well, here's why. Because of man's, humanity's, sinful, self-centered nature. Because people tend to take advantage, even abuse those under their authority for selfish reasons. Why did God have to give these rules? Because he knows us. He knows us. He knows we'll take advantage of those under our authority for our own selfish benefit. He knows that we won't always look out for the welfare and dignity of those who've been placed under our charge. That's why he has to give these rules, because we are sinful. Oh, you've seen it. Employers. They give their employees as little pay and benefits as they can get away with in order to increase their own profits. They're not looking out for the welfare and dignity of their employees. They don't care if they're having to get food stamps. Just get all the money in my pocket. I, can't, I know those people exist because I've worked for some of them. I know a pastor right now has been in a church over 15 years and never been given a raise. How many of you know how much inflation has gone up in the last 15 years? How much the cost of living has gone up? It happens. Supervisors on the job, who a foreman or someone who, you know, you have other people working under you and you get the God complex and you talk down to them and you issue orders to them, make them do things you're really supposed to do. Why? Because it boosts your own twisted ego. How many of you have seen that happen? Supervisors take advantage of those under them. Here's one for you. You leave the children home under the watch care of the older sibling, teenage daughter. She makes them do the chores while she stays on the phone and eats ice cream. Don't tell me that kind of stuff don't happen. I'm a parent. How about this? The pastor who uses his pulpit to constantly berate and criticize and condemn the congregation in order to somehow feel better about himself. The father who treats his wife and children as if they exist to serve him. I know a few of those. And by the looks on your faces, you know a few of those too. Policemen, teachers, parents, all of these and many, many others that you could name have been known to take advantage of those under their authority and care. The inherent selfishness of fallen humanity sometimes causes those who are in some place of authority to neglect or ignore the welfare and dignity of those under their authority and this is wickedness in the eyes of God. Especially for those who have been commanded to love our neighbor as ourself. What we learn about God is obvious. God cares about the welfare and dignity of those under our authority. What do we learn about ourselves? Well, we learn we need these rules because we're sinful. And we don't always look out for the welfare and dignity of those God's put under our charge. Well, finally, let's notice what we learn about the gospel. The gospel is pictured very clearly in one particular verse. Verse 9, I want you to look at it. If a master designates a female servant for his son, in other words, to marry her, to, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. Here's the picture. A man has redeemed a female servant. In other words, he's purchased her. Gives her to his son as a bride and adopts her into his family. I don't know if you know, that's the gospel. God the Father 
has purchased us, redeemed us. Sometimes the Bible uses the word ransomed us. He has ransomed us, bought us for himself, given us to Christ to be the bride of Christ and adopted us into his family. Let me give you just a few scriptures. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. They're celebrating Christ purchasing people for God by the cost of his own life. How about the being the bride of Christ? Here's 1, 2 Corinthians eleven two. 2. Paul said to the church, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him, purchased by God to be the bride of Christ. Picturing the church corporately, not us individually, but the church as a whole as the bride of Christ. And what about adoption? Ephesians 1.5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. See, this is what God has done for us in Christ. He's purchased us by the blood of his own son. He's given us to Christ as a bride and adopted us into his family. Listen, this is what God has done. This is how God has acted on your behalf for your welfare and dignity. What has he done for your welfare? He's given you eternal life. What has he done for your dignity? He's made you a son of the most high God. You can't get any higher than that. There's no higher place on the rung to go. There's no greater welfare than eternal life in heaven. God has given his darling son in order to purchase you, give you to his son as a bride, and adopt you into his family. That being so, that being so, in light of all that God has done, how could you disregard the welfare and dignity of those gods placed under your authority? Here's what I need you to see. God's concern for your welfare and dignity should overflow in concern for the welfare and dignity of others. When you, when, it, when you really get it, I don't mean when you hear it, yeah, I understand that. No, no, when it really takes root in your heart, when, when, it, when it really dawns on you just how incredibly wicked you were and how incredibly perfect God is and all that he's done to reconcile you to himself, purchased you at the cost of the precious blood of his own son, when all of that really dawns on you, you realize how incredibly, amazingly, wonderfully God has treated you, then you just can't go out and mistreat other people like that. When when you really get it, that love God has for you overflows in love for other people. That's why Jesus said the way they'll know you're Christian is how you love one another. If it's absent, you don't belong to it. All that God has done for you should overflow in the way you treat those under your authority. See, the, the, the transforming work of Jesus by the gospel, it gives us not only the desire to care for the welfare and dignity of others, but it gives us the ability. His love overflows in our hearts so that we want, we want to give the best to those under our authority. We want them to succeed. We want to do all for them we possibly can. And by his spirit, he enables us to do so. So, let me ask a few questions. Teachers, what does it look like for you to demonstrate genuine concern for the welfare and dignity of all of your students. All of them equally. I don't have time to spell that out for you. 
But you need to think about that. What does that look like? For you to do what you do, not for selfish reasons, but for their welfare and dignity. Employers, those of you who employ other people, what does it look like for you to demonstrate genuine care and concern for the welfare and dignity of your employees? What does it look like? Instead of paying them as little as you can get away with, how about paying them as much as you can afford to? Even if it takes a little money out of your pocket, you got more than you need anyway. Leaders, you may be a leader of a committee or some organization. Parents, grandparents, listen, what does it look like for you to demonstrate genuine care and concern for the welfare and dignity of those you lead? It's a question I need to ask myself, Corey, Katie, Caleb, all of us who are in leadership, our deacons. What does it look like? Here's the bottom line. You should care for the welfare and dignity of those under your authority because God does. It matters to God. In light of all God has done for us, redeeming us, giving us as a bride to his son, adopting us as his own. Listen, let's eagerly and joyfully seek the welfare and dignity of those God's placed under our authority. We should want to do that. We should eagerly, gladly do that. Listen, let's be leaders who do everything we can for the welfare and dignity of those we lead. Let's be parents who do everything we can for the welfare and dignity of our children and grandchildren. Let's be employers who do everything we can for the welfare and dignity of those we employ. Let's be teachers who do everything we can for the welfare and dignity of our students. Let's be supervisors who do everything we can for the welfare and dignity of those we supervise. Oh, Christian, listen. Your welfare and dignity has been secured by Christ. So use whatever authority that you have to pursue the welfare and dignity of others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray first and foremost that this message would resonate in my own heart. That I would remember that as the under-shepherd of your people, I am here to serve and not be served. That I am here for the welfare and dignity of others, not for the benefit of myself. Oh God, please, let me not just know that, but let me live in light of that and live that out each day. God, I pray for our teachers who are going back to school this year. I have confidence that our teachers already are concerned for the welfare and dignity of their students. I pray that this message would reinforce that in them, give them a, a new resolve to gen genuinely seek the best for every single student. I pray for those in our church who are employers, that they'll think about their practices. Are, are they really seeking what's absolutely best for those under them? Whether we're parents, whoever we are, whatever position we're in, are we pursuing the welfare and dignity of others? Oh, God, that we would. In light of all you've done for us, how could we do less? Amen. Listen, this morning we're going to have a time of invitation. Maybe there's something on your heart that completely unrelated to this message. The Lord's just dealing with you and you, you need to talk, you need prayer. Hey, would you come? I'd love to talk to you. Sit down with you. We'll talk it out. While we sing, you can come. If maybe you feel God's moving on your heart to become part of this church, we would rejoice with you. You can come during our invitation time, and I'll sit down with you and explain to you how that needs to happen. Maybe today, as you've witnessed this baptism, you'd say, you know what? I, I've surrendered my life to Christ, but I've never been faithful to follow him in baptism. Well, listen, you're disobedient. If, you, if you're a Christian and you have not publicly followed him in baptism, then you've, you've disobeyed the very first command you've ever been given. 
but we can take care of that. That baptistry is going to be filled for the next two Sundays. Praise the Lord. So if you'll come, I can talk with you about that. Whatever's on your heart today, we want to give you a chance to respond. Please stand. We're going to sing.